this is very topical and very important. Um, I'm looking forward to learning a lot tonight and I'd like to welcome Dr. Alistair Leake who's going to talk to us about the Allerton project. Uh, welcome, Alistair. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, and, and welcome to everybody else. I'm, I'm delighted to, uh, to join you. Um, and I'm sorry, as I say, when we're not in person, but anyway, hey, this is this is best we can do. Um, so I'm going to take you through a short presentation, which I'll outline the work of the Allison Project. Let's uh, let's get going then. So um, I'm Alice Leake. I'm head of the Allison Project. The Allison Project is an 800 acre farm in East uh, Leicestershire, right up against the Rutland border. And we've been around for about 30 years in our current form, established in 1992 by the late Lord and Lady Allerton. Uh, Lord and Lady Allerton were unfortunate in that their children predeceased them. And so they had no uh, one to leave the, the land to. And, and they didn't want the farm just to be sold off and the money given away to to charity, there being no other heirs or successors. Um, so instead they wanted it to be used for some useful purpose to um, better mankind. Uh, and so we are effectively a lowland research and demonstration farm for the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust because that's the charity they chose to, to, to leave it to. Um, no, there's nothing special about this farm. It, it's an 800 acre typical East Midlands mix farm on a pretty heavy soil, grade three soil. So, you know, cropping is quite challenging. Um, and we've, we, we've turned this, this land asset, if you like, into a research and educational facility. So there's an aerial view of the, of the farm. Uh, we're in high Leicestershire here, so uh, 500 feet above sea level, which means that uh, we're always a bit late doing everything compared to people uh, lower down and certainly people further east. Um, uh, but uh, a, a remote and, and, and very beautiful part of the world, actually, very undiscovered and unspoilt. Um, just, just one dwelling uh, built in this village in the last 60 years, you know, so uh, there's not much goes on around here. Um, so they left us some fairly straightforward objectives um, to combine productive farming with wildlife conservation. And I've highlighted the word productive there because we've made a very conscious decision not to go organic. Um, I farmed organically before I took over here uh, for a period of over 10 years. And during that time, I compared my productive output with, with, with that of two other farming systems that I ran alongside the organic system. Uh, and across that 10 year period, the productivity of the organic farm was 40% was lower than uh, the conventional one. And I'll say a few more uh, words about why that's important uh, uh, shortly. Uh, and the second objective was to carry out research into the interaction between farming and wildlife conservation, uh, resource management and the environment generally. So um, they didn't um, push us into a tight set of requirements, uh, which is very, uh, very fortunate because we now find that dealing with uh, climate change and biodiversity loss, we actually need to look at the whole picture. Just uh, uh, examining one thing is not is not sufficient. And finally, um, you know, my team here, there's, a, there's 12 of us work here, um, half of us are scientists. Um, uh, we've published over 250 papers um, over the last 30 years. Um, but one thing I've discovered is that the, the farmers and politicians and policymakers don't read research papers. So uh, we have to get this information out to the people that are making decisions. And we do that actually very effectively. And we, we're, we're very much involved in designing the new environmental land management scheme, which will pay farmers to, to deliver um, environmental uh, goods in the countryside. So um, back to my uh, point about productive, uh, you know, our world population is continuing to grow and that with it, th the demand for food um, and the population, not just of the world, but, but of England is growing year on year too. And these people, everybody's going to need feeding. Um, in the uh, 
in the mid 1980s, we were about 80% self-sufficient in indigenous or homegrown food. And, and that's dropped to below 60% now, and that is still going down. Now, you have to bear in mind that against that backdrop, the government of pledged to plant 30,000 hectares of trees every year uh, up to 2050. You've got people wanting to de-intensify and rewild land. Um, you've got a big issue on our most productive land in the fens, which is that that fenland peat soil accounts for 70% of the soil carbon emissions in the UK are coming from that one soil type. And the only way to stop that carbon dioxide coming out of that soil is to re-wet it. If you re-wet it, you won't be able to farm it. So we've got some real challenges here that we've got to cover uh, in order to continue to produce food, as well as deliver all the benefits for nature that we also want to see. And against that backdrop, if I look at the wheat yields uh, for the UK um, since the 1980s, uh, from the period about 1950 to 1980, we steadily increased our yields. But really, from the 1990s, th those, those yields have, have really flattened off. And, and actually, in the last three years, and I'm sorry I haven't had time to add the, that, that data, that those yields have actually fallen in response to some really challenging weather conditions that we face both sowing crops and harvesting them. So, so getting more production from the existing land that we're farming uh, looks to me like it's going to be very, very difficult to, to achieve. And in fact, the, the land available to each feed each one of us has dropped from two acres to half an acre in the last 50 years. So that's just a sobering thought that that's the land that we, we rely on to, to feed us. And against that backdrop, we also have this uh, disastrous uh, graph. Well, it is particularly for the red line perspective, which is our, our farmland birds, which have really suffered because of uh, intensification of, uh, of agriculture. And it's interesting to note that just as our yields have stopped uh, going up at the same rate and have leveled off, so the decline in farmland birds has stopped going down as fast as it was and leveled off. Um, so there is perhaps some hope um, for, for uh, recovery. So um, if I'm to plot here, uh, the national breeding birds, which we first started counting in the 1960s, so we've got no data before that, and we plot those against the national wheat yield, you can see the, the, the birds going down as the wheat yield went up. Um, when we took the farm over in 1992, uh, we set about a new management regime, which was designed to try and reverse the decline of those uh, birds. Uh, and we did that by improving that, the habitat around the farm, um, providing food for birds through hoppers during the winter time, a bit like people do in their own back gardens, and perhaps slightly controversially, uh, controlling predators during the, the breeding season. So this would be magpies and crows and foxes. Uh, and rats, things like that. Uh, and and we, we put this, this plan of action into place and then measured how the birds responded. And the response was both immediate and dramatic. So the red line there shows what happened to our farmland birds with that management regime. Now, this really is quite extraordinary because um, we, 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 we expected an effect, but we didn't expect such a dramatic effect and for it to happen so quickly. And it, to me, it shows us that we, we do know what to do. Uh, to put this problem right. And we just need the right policies and farmers to act as we've done, and we would be able to see this as a national picture. Uh, and what I find interesting about this is that the, the level at which that red line leveled off at is 
at the same level as we were in the 1960s, when our wheat yields were a quarter of what they are now. And, and actually, just to complete the exercise, what I then did was to plot our wheat yields against our farmland birds rather than the national wheat yields against the national farmland birds. And, and to my amazement, I found that our wheat yields actually exceeded the national average. Now, this really is counter to everybody's belief that you can have intensive farming and biodiversity coexisting, but we demonstrated that we could very much do that. And I think that gives us great hope that we can continue to feed ourselves, but without doing it at the expense of wildlife. So I'm now going to take you through um, some management changes that we've made over the last 30 years and just look at how the birds have responded to those changes. So I've already shown you this bit, which is the bit from 1992 to 2001. At 1992 was our baseline year. So we didn't instigate any management change during that year. We just counted what we'd already got here. We then instigated the habitat improvement, winter feeding and predator control uh, system. And we doubled our farmland birds uh, across, across the farm area. And that inevitably led to people asking us one simple question, which was, which of the three things that you've done do you think has had the biggest effect? Is it the habitat management? Is it the feeding? Or is it controlling the predators? Now, the best way to test that is to systematically deconstruct what you've done. Uh, we call it the three-legged stool. So basically, we're going to chop a leg off at a time. So the first leg we chopped off was the predator control. So we let the magpies and crows do what they will. And you can see that that did impact on our songbird numbers. They, 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 they went down when we did that. And when, when that decline leveled off, we then took away the winter feeding and they went down again. And in fact, in 2009, you can see that they're really very little different to how the bird numbers were when they came, when we came here in 1992, which sort of demonstrates that managing habitat on its own for farmland birds is probably not going to be enough and will not deliver our government's targets to reverse the decline and instigate a recovery in our songbird numbers. Having reached the end of that particular phase in 2010, uh, what we did was we brought the wildlife warden back again and repeated the first cycle of the, the trial. And, and as you can see, um, the bird numbers went, went up again, um, um, not, not with ease. Uh, 2013, you see there's, there's, there's a depression there. That's because we had a really cold, wet spring, which didn't favour uh, the birds, which does tell us that climate change is also going to pay, pay, play a dynamic in, in, this, um, in this going forward. Um, so, and as you can see, our part-time warden was um, only part-time, whereas the previous one was full-time, and we gave him more hectares to manage. So um, he uh, had quite a challenge on his hands. But some people also asked, how did you manage to increase your wheat yields at the same time as your songbirds? And, and, and what we did actually was really quite simple. Um, because our combine harvesters can now map the, the yield that they're taking on board the combine as we, we drive around the fields, we observed that regularly the outside five to 10 meters of the field is the lowest yielding part of the farm. Uh, and so what we did was we, we took those areas out of wheat production and we turned them over to wildlife production. In this case, you've got a, a crop of uh, quinoa, which is being grown to, to feed birds in the wintertime in a strip running up the, the side of the field. We, we also found that by adding uh, crop protection inputs and fertilizers to these wildlife seed mixes, we could get them to produce more seed and therefore feed more birds through the winter time. 
So if you visit the Allerton project, you'll very much see our fields laid out like this with the hedge, a tussocky grass margin, which is also very good for, for wildlife, and then a designer seed mix, which has been grown to feed birds during the winter time on a piece of land which doesn't yield very productively for, for me, the, the, the farmer, uh, and then the, the main part of the crop out into the field, which is the bit that we that we harvest. And by taking out the least productive areas, we, we boosted the overall yield per hectare of crop sown, which was why our, our yields um, actually went up. Uh, these wildlife seed mixes that we grow up the side of the fields, however, are not perfect. Um, the birds tend to have eaten all the seed by the time you get to January. Uh, and quite clearly, if they don't get fed um, from January onwards, then the population collapses as if there was no food at all uh, given to them. Uh, they, they, they still die, even if it's just later in the winter. So one of the ways we got around this was to start to feed these birds through our own bird feeders around the farm. This, this is a pheasant feeder, which has been adapted from a chute um, to feed farmland birds. And, um, and what we see, we've got a camera on this so we did some filming of these just to see which birds were, were feeding and, and when uh, they were doing it so you can see some yellow hammers coming in here um, to try and get some some food um, in late February when when the stubbles are are, are pretty bare and of course the, the the downside of putting food out in the countryside is that uh, it's not always the things you want that, that go for it some of the things that you you don't want uh, try to find a way to, to get it as well, which is quite important to have a, a wildlife warden who's able to control um, some of those. And um, what we found was that when we fed the birds for five years, compared to when we stopped feeding them for five years, we consistently had double the number of birds on the farm. So this really does emphasize the importance of winter feed and, and, and seed for birds. And then the other thing that's critical in a bird's life cycle is provision of insects in, in the spring and summertime. And, and we know this because of um, about 50 years of work on this particular bird here, the gray partridge, um, <clears throat> which we've been studying uh, on a site in Sussex now for, for over 50 years. Um, and, and we found that, that insects are absolutely critical to great partridge chicks within the first week or two of their lives. And, and what applies to the gray partridge is also applies to a whole range of other uh, farmland birds too. Even those which grow up to be vegetarian as adults uh, need a high insect uh, rich diet in the early days uh, of their lives. And, and the correlation of gray partridge numbers with uh, the amount of insects is, is, is very clear. Um, each one of these dots represents a year of data. So there's only over 20 years of data on that graph. And what we're basically showing on, 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 the, on the vertical axis is the number of partridge chicks which survive um, uh, through to fledging uh, against the uh, abundance of insects in the, in the crops of cereals. And as you can see, the, the, the more insects that there are around, um, the better the chicks survive. So that, that's, that's very clear. And actually, this site in Sussex, uh, back in 2003, when we, um, when we went uh, in and having, having achieved this tremendous result here in Leicestershire, the Allerton Project, doubling our songbirds, uh, the owner of a, a, an estate in Sussex got in touch with us and said, can you do the same thing on my farm, but for grey partridges? Uh, and that area circled there with the purple ring is the estate. And the, the red dots you can see there are the little coveys of grey partridge. So they, they really were nearly extinct on this farm. Um, we brought in our prescription of habitat improvement, winter feeding and control of predators. And, and by 2010, this farm was awash with grey partridges. The response was absolutely dramatic. Um, and this is really important too, because it shows that what we, what we do on a clay soil uh, high up in uh, 
cold Leicestershire um, can be repeated on a chalky, warm downland soil in the south of England. Um, doesn't matter where you are, the, um, the success remains the same. And uh, birds aren't the only things which thrive under this management regime. Um, the farm here um, saw an absolute explosion in uh, brown hair numbers. Um, we have another farm which is five miles away, the village of Hallerton. Um, we've been counting the hares there ever since we took ownership of this farm in 92. You can see that the, the hares at Hallerton are hanging on in there, not showing any dramatic increase at all. But when we were controlling foxes up until 2000, uh, up until 2000 um, hares, did, hares did quite well. In fact, they did so well that we did have to shoot them. Otherwise, they all the wildlife seed mixes, so we couldn't feed the birds. Um, but when we stopped controlling the foxes, the, the foxes came in and controlled the hares. And it wasn't until we brought the keeper back in 2011, started uh, controlling foxes again, did the hare numbers go, um, go back up. So that's quite a, uh, a big difference too. Um, some of the other species we're, we're measuring are, are moths, uh, both species and, uh, and numbers. And we've been measuring those since 1995. And again, we have a trend here, which is bucking the national trend. The national trend for both species and numbers is, is downward. Um, our farm here, both are upward, which again, I think is an indication of the improved habitat that we have here, which is providing uh, better opportunities uh, for, um, for our moths. And of course, we have antagonists to deal with too. I mean, one of the reasons why our songbirds are struggling is that magpie numbers are three times the levels that they were in the 1960s. So, you know, if we, are, if we really do aspire to get our songbird numbers back to where they were in the 1960s, uh, then we, we, this is something that we, we're going to have to grasp because magpies are undoubtedly having an impact on our blackbirds and our, and our song thrushes. So that's me taking you through a canter on what we did with farmland birds and, and, and brown hares. I, I now want to say a little bit uh, about some of the other work that we've done. As I mentioned at the outset, Lord and Lady Allerton didn't pigeonhole us into some very tight requirements, but we have the freedom to look at a whole range of things. Uh, and so we've done quite a lot of work on, on, on soil and water, particularly related to soil erosion. Um, soil erosion is becoming an increasing problem as we uh, deal with climate change, with, with heavy rainfall events on, on sloping land. Um, we see soil getting washed away and we really can't afford to allow that to, to continue because the soil is, is what's going to feed us going forward and future generations. So we've had a whole load of uh, research studies which have looked at the different methods of cultivation, what impacts runoff, uh, what constitutes a healthy soil ecology, um, looking at putting beetle banks across slopes to try to break up the uh, flow of water running running down the uh, running down the, the slope and, and looking at how we manage the tractor wheelings, the so-called tram lines uh, in the fields, which are co uh, compacted um, uh, uh, lines which uh, fill up with water and very easily um, very easily erode. Um, we've also looked at how we can enhance our earthworm numbers, uh, and these do play a really, really important part in helping us to get the water to infiltrate uh, into the soil. And here I've got two little soil pits. The, the one on the left hand side of the screen um, is a field which has been regularly ploughed, and the the, 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 the the pit on the right hand side of the screen is, is one that we've stopped ploughing and um, this has been very beneficial to the earthworms. Their numbers have built up dramatically and as you can see it, what I've done with this pit is I put a little white disc over each one of the earthworm channels just so that you can see it for the photograph. Now, now you can imagine chucking a bucket of water into each one of those pits uh, and watching it uh, drain quite clearly the one on the right hand side is going to drain much more quickly than the one on the left because there are more earthworm burrows and they are bigger 
as well. And this is really important to helping us go forward and deal with climate change, because when it rains really hard, we need the water to soak in, not run off the surface and carry the soil with it. But secondly, when we go through droughty periods, the, the crop is going to need to get its roots down through those earthworm channels to access the moisture deep in the soil and keep on growing uh, through the drought. And this is exactly what we saw in 2018 when we had a summer drought. The fields with the high earthworm numbers also yielded the highest yields because they were able to, to get moisture. So uh, we've shifted away from a plough-based tillage system to one where we really just tickle the surface, if indeed at all. Uh, very often we sow the crop directly into the stubble of the previous crop. You can see here a, a crop of wheat emerging in an oat stubble with uh, oat straw lying on the surface. That, that straw also helps to protect the soil against erosion by cushioning the impact of rainfall droplets when, when they they fall on the soil. So all this uh, work is uh, very good, but here we are, we're only 800 acres in Leicestershire. Uh, we need farmers across the country to be doing that. So that's exactly where our educational programme comes in. And uh, prior to the pandemic, about 4,000 people a year pass through, uh, pass through here, uh, coming to see uh, for themselves the work that we do. Um, I don't expect people to go away and adopt everything we do. Um, that would not be possible. But if each farmer just goes away and does one thing or two things of what we've done, then that would start to make a difference. And as our visitor numbers have grown, we, we've had to uh, develop our facilities on site. So you can see here we have an old cattle shed, which we originally converted into um, into some offices and a lab, uh, but we've now turned this into a new purpose-built uh, visitor and training centre. And um, we, we've tried to emulate in the building what we're trying to do out on the farm in terms of sustainability. So we have surrounded the building with 500 bales of our own homemade straw. Uh, this uh, used eight times less energy than using man-made insulation, but gives us double the insulation capacity. And of course, straw is mostly carbon. So we've locked that carbon dioxide up in the straw and now it's locked up into the building, uh, helping keep us warm in winter and uh, cool in summertime. We then um, chip all our <clears throat> coppiced uh, hedgerow and uh, brashwood, which comes from our woodland management. And we, we shoot that into one of our grain trailers. Uh, the, the chipper itself uh, costs a million pounds, I'm told, but we only hire it by the hour. Uh, and it's a bit like following a combine harvester, to be honest with you. Uh, the chipper chips uh, and shoots it into the trailer, just like a combine would shoot wheat into the trailer. Um, <clears throat> we, we, with this, this stuff we used to try to burn in the field to get rid of it by pouring diesel on it um, very ineffectively. Um, the, the, the grain trailers cart the wood chip down to the, to the grain store. We tip it on the floor, which is a vented floor. It blows air up through it, which helps to dry it. And we use 128 solar panels on the roof to provide the electricity to dry that, that wood chip. The visitor centre itself is, uh, is, is heated and, and the electricity comes from the solar panels on the roof. Uh, and you won't be able to see this tank anymore. This is a rainwater harvesting tank. It's buried un underground. But all the water from the roof goes into that tank to flush the toilets so that we're not flushing drinking water quality down the toilets that's been pumped all the way up from the reservoir using... Uh, electricity. And then the car park we've made permeable, so when it rains very hard, the water doesn't run off and cause flooding down further down the catchment. Uh, this is actually made out of recycled silage wrap. Um, silage wrap is a really difficult thing to get rid of because it's, it's, it tends to be dirty um, and uh, difficult to recycle and therefore tends to end up in landfill. But you can make it into this permeable, um, hard standing area. And, and the advantage of it being permeable is we've actually been able to sow it with wildflowers and get them to grow. So, so, so the car park now actually is more of a wildlife habitat than it was when it was a field. 
because it's got all these uh, flowering plants uh, within it. And um, we entered our building into uh, a competition, uh, which I'm delighted to say we won sustainable devel development of the year. And, and we, we beat the first carbon neutral office block to, to get that uh, award. And the following year, we were uh, awarded a, a rural business award as well for, um, for our development. So um, I'll just finish off with a, a final few slides to talk about um, the people that we, we work with. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we now see over 4,000 visitors uh, pass through here, and um, I'm hoping we'll add Market Bosworth Natural History Group to that, uh, to that number when we're allowed to do so. Actually, we can all meet outside here, and we can go on a farm walk without any risk at all. So I'm going to encourage Janet that when, when next uh, spring comes, that we, we have you out here to have an evening with us. Um, and we attract all sorts of people that come to see what we're doing, from environmental groups uh, to sort of policy makers and, uh, and politicians. Um, um, we work very closely uh, with Nestle, um, with 100 dairy farmers in the, the Lake District. We do their conservation plans for them. Uh, these are the guys that provide the milk that goes into the 8 million Kit Kat bars that come out of York every day. We also work with Kellogg's. Uh, we do the conservation plans for the farmers that supply the 100,000 tonnes of English wheat, which goes into making your special K uh, for your breakfast uh, in the morning. So we've got some uh, important partners um, there that, we, that we're with. And then uh, quite a lot of people in the agricultural supply chain too. And then uh, the, the visitor centre, training centre gets used as a community centre too. Um, th th this village is like many, many small villages. We have one church. It has no electricity to it, no water to it. Uh, it's out in the middle of a field, so there's no parking, there's no heating. Uh, it really doesn't lend itself to anything else. Um, so this has produced um, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to engage with, with the community, which has uh, proved incredibly useful. Uh, and we're, we're also bringing children from Peterborough and from Leicester, Mansfield in Nottinghamshire and from Corby, uh, many of whom have never, ever visited a farm in their lives and don't know where their, their food comes from, never mind the nature uh, which we see uh, on the farm. So. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's really me uh, uh, finished giving you an introduction to the Allerton project, but uh, it would be wonderful um, to see you here uh, to see it for yourselves at some time. And I'll now pass back to, uh, to uh, our chairman uh, to uh, field any questions. Thank you. I'll kick off if that's okay. When you double the number of farmland birds, um, is the range of species increasing or is it the same birds like the yellow hammers that you're seeing a lot more of and you had very few of in the first place or are there or is there a bigger range of species yeah we have, we have a bigger range of species as well i think probably the best example is is the, the tree sparrow the tree sparrow was was not was not here when we arrived there were there were none um, when the keeper started feeding in the in the winter time, the, the tree sparrows came back, um, but they didn't breed. They didn't breed because there were no nesting sites. So the ecologist here started to nail up nest boxes in colonies on ash trees around the farm, and then they started to breed then as well. And, and now they're colonising other farms around us from from, from our site. So, so that's a, a very good example of a, of a species which has returned. Not the only one. Um, the number of species of moths have, has, has gone up. And um, there were no grasshoppers here at all for the first decade. Uh, and now grasshoppers are extremely common across the whole farm. Dave Underwood would like to ask a question. So Dave, if you want to unmute yourself, that would be good. Um, thanks, Alistair. That was uh, fascinating. Um, <laughs> I've got two little questions. Um, you mentioned DEFRA on the slide. Have your successes visibly influenced or changed DEFRA uh, policies going forward, um, particularly with respect to the wildlife and things? Um, 
Yeah. So in the environmental stewardship scheme, there are a whole range of options which were devised by our scientists, which farmers are now paid to do. These include pollen and nectar mix options, wildlife seed mix options, conservation headlands, uh, beetle banks, to name just a few of the more high profile ones which, which, which farmers uh, farmers adopt. Uh, and so that, that will have had an effect around the country. Uh, I think what we're looking forward to in, in the new environmental land management scheme, which we're busy designing at the moment, we have the opportunity to reward farmers over and above the income for gone for taking land out of production for nature and the cost incurred for, for, for managing that land, which, which under the common agricultural policy in the EU meant the farmers, the rules were that farmers were not allowed to make money out of wildlife conservation. Uh, if we can allow farmers to make money out of wildlife conservation, I think you'll see a very big change in the way people uh, manage their land. Yeah. And, and just as a, as a supplement, because you've sort of half introduced my second question there, um, it's been very topical in the news um, the last week or so about um, farmers, especially young farmers, you know, struggling to get hold of land and to start farms up. And um, the, the annual sort of living wage of farmers being very poor. Do you see the things with your productivity and things uh, being able to relate directly to that? Does, does that help them along? Will you see a change in the future or are farms going to be gobbled up by people wanting you know, a bigger home and a bit of rewilding or something like that? Well, th that, that is always um, going to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are, it is very difficult farming at the moment. I have to tell you that I, I've been, I've been in the industry myself for, for 30 years. And, and I think, you know, the, these times are the toughest. We, we, we can, we can cope with the reduction in the subsidies, providing we can cope with the the weather and, and, and what that's throwing at us. And right now it is a real struggle to do that. Uh, last year we lost 40% of our oat crop because a storm came through in September and, and shook the ears out and, and we couldn't have harvested it earlier because the straw was still green and it wouldn't go through the combine. Uh, not only was that a disaster for my crop of oats but those oats then lay on the so soil surface and germinated and uh, provided a, a, a great mat of greenery which it was impossible for to drill the next crop into. So that delayed the drilling of the next crop and that then affected the yield of that crop in this year. So we have this knock-on effect going from season to season uh, when we start to get into, into difficulties. Um, so it is a challenge for younger people coming in. I mean, one good thing that might come out of this is that the subsidy payments meant that the value of land far exceeded its uh, capacity to earn an income from producing food. Uh, you know, the, the, the value of the land was very much tied to the subsidy. So, so with the subsidy diminishing, the land prices may well go down and that might make it easier for younger people to, to get into farming. Incidentally, I, I'm, I'm not from a farming background at all. I am born in inner city, Bristol. Um, in order for me to get into farming, I've had to farm somebody else's land for them. That's, that, that's the only way I could do it. John Walton's got a question. You haven't mentioned anything about uh, wildflower uh, conservation at all. Uh, my, um, the biggest problem for that is uh, eutrophication, which is mainly caused by uh, runoff and extra nitrogen and nitrogen uh, uh, fallout from uh, vehicles as well. And that's destroying lots and lots of, uh, of sensitive plants throughout the country. You also mentioned you put uh, uh, fertilizer on your strips of uh, a seed mix along the side. Now that's likely surely to, demo, uh, to destroy uh, colonies of bryophytes. There's a lot of arable bryophytes that are very rare in this country, in this country, and a lot of arable weeds as well. You haven't mentioned these at all. What are your thoughts? Um, well, first of all, we, we don't have many arable weeds um, or, or particularly rare ones here, mostly because the, the land would have been largely pasture land up until the war when it was 
ploughed out. So, so the the arable weed seed bank is not reflective of one of an ancient seed bank as such. I mean, what, what we do see where we take land out of production and, and turn it back to nature is actually many of the traditional grassland weeds return like cowslips. Cowslips are, are in abundance uh, on the farm here now. Um, we, we do also have an ancient hay meadow, um, which has got over 60 species of plants, in, including uh, orchids and, and yellow rattle and so on. <laughs> and that, that, that is... Um, that, that is rich quite simply because the field has never been sprayed or had fertilizer uh, added to it. So it's one of the part of the 3% of ancient hay meadows that still do exist. But, but you're, you're, you're quite right. Um, the, the, the problem with productive agriculture is that, that in order to produce, we, we, we put inputs. And if you want to revert that back to, um, you know, to old hay meadows, that then the first thing you need to do is to deplete the fertility out of the soil um, to, to get it down to low fertility when those weed species will thrive. So I, I may not have mentioned them, um, but they're not uh, off my radar uh, by any means, um, but just um, li limited in what I can tell you in a, in a short presentation. Thank you. During your presentation, Alistair, when you were talking about the number of songbirds and you mentioned... Um, obviously controlling things like crows and magpies and other predators. On one of your graphs, you did show that the magpie numbers have increased hugely uh, since 1966. Is there any particular reason why should the numbers should increase? Um, that's very difficult to say. Um, I would think there's probably two things going on there. One is there are less gamekeepers about controlling magpies than there used to be in the 1960s. But I would put the principal reason down to the availability of roadkill, which is feeding the magpies through the winter time when normally their numbers would have been curtailed by a shortage of food. If you think about the um, volume of traffic, the speed of traffic um, that we have now compared to uh, back in the 1960s, um, th this is producing a, a, a bountiful resource uh, to feed scavengers such as magpies, yeah. Well, thank you, that was, uh, yeah, I, mean, I did wonder whether there was sort of a, a more environmental reason as to why they should increase, similarly to foxes, I suppose, with urban gardens and towns being a good sort of place for food and things like that. I'd be very keen to organise a visit um, next year. Would, would you um, have a suggested best time to, to come or is that not the point? It would be information that you would be giving us anyway, whatever the season. No, well, there's always something going on in yeah. the countryside. Yeah. But, but um, you know, if you... if uh, just for the purposes of an evening meeting uh, and the weather and yeah. the songbirds, um, you know, you, you probably want to come uh, in May or June. Yeah. yeah. Um, May, May is particularly fine in my view. Yeah. Uh, and then you can see the issues with crop failure and, and we can talk about all those things, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, we have a circular route which we can walk around the farm, which is, which is very pleasant, and it makes for a lovely, a lovely evening walk. Actually, thank you. Do you do you finance all your work from the the farm, or um, your partners help to finance it, or how, how do you finance everything that's happening? Lord and Lady Allerton left us a. A legacy which we yeah. has been invested very wisely by my trustees uh, we draw a small income from that traditionally the, the farm profits provided the rest of the income but mercifully um, I'm no longer reliant on those farm profits which is a very good job because they are now non-existent uh, and so all the income we are we are completely self-supporting here uh, we get no um, support from, from, from elsewhere other than what we uh, garner through our own efforts. Um, those efforts include uh, research contracts um, to, to carry out fundamental research, which are mostly actually still funded 
by the European Union because the government decided to say, stay signed up to the EU research programmes, which, which is very fortunate for us because it allows us to, to bid um, into that pot of money, um, which, of course, the UK government also pays into. Um, so that, that, that is our biggest source of public money at the moment. Um, we've just won a Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund grant, uh, which will pay us to put together a calculation matrix that will allow a farmer to work out how much carbon is stored in his hedgerow. And then we do the commercial work for companies like Marks and Spencers, uh, Waitrose, uh, Kellogg's uh, and Nestle. And we run training courses for farmers to come and learn how to do it. Uh, agronomists, we run a, a professional qualification for agronomists in conservation management, um, which many uh, agronomists are choosing to study for now because their clients are expecting to be guided by them. Uh, and that will be important for them to access grants going forward. So um, we have a, a, a variety of sources of funding, uh, something I'm very comfortable with. I, I, can I equate it to growing lots of different crops on your farm? Um, if one crop fails, then hopefully the rest do OK and, uh, and you'll come through. Alistair, when you were talking about um, ploughing techniques in the area, are you discussing earthworms and stuff? Um, you mentioned as well that you're actually not doing so much ploughing now, but, but doing direct sowing and including direct sowing into the stubble, which I thought was very interesting because I've also attended other talks where we're talking about lack of earthworms in farmland because of um, deep ploughing. But it is such an ingrained activity in the farming community. I wonder whether that approach is being adopted by anywhere outside your particular project? Yes, um, back in 1999, we, we did a survey of tillage practice and we found that 90% of the arable land in, in England was, was being ploughed. Uh, we carried out a survey again in 2006, so that was seven years later, and, and found that there'd been a massive change in that period of time with, with over half the farmers moving away from ploughing to what we call minimal tillage, where, where you don't turn the soil over the way the plough does, but you just tickle the surface. And, and some of those farmers have gone the next step and actually don't tickle the surface at all, but just put the seed straight in. Um, it does require you to make sure you look after your soil very carefully, because the one thing the plough does is, is take out a whole load of uh, compaction. Um, and so if you compact the soil by driving across it during a wet harvest, then you're not going to be able to sow directly into it. You're going to have to do some remedial work. Um, we've been using a um, new piece of equipment, which has been developed called a low disturbance subsoiler, which allows us to take compaction out of the soil by dragging this tined implement through the ground uh, without ploughing. Uh, and this is proving very useful, not, not just for the soil structure and for our cropping, but also for the earthworms, because it won't surprise you to learn that they don't like compacted soil either. Uh, they can't move about in the soil that's compacted. Um, once we get the earthworm numbers up, and we, we've got one field here where we've gone from 200 earthworms per cubic metre to 700 earthworms per cubic metre over an 11 year period, uh, they will start to do a lot of the work in, in the soil for you. Um, uh, not quite free of charge. You, you've, you've got to feed them, which means chopping straw or, or spreading manure on the land to, to give them uh, plenty to eat. Um, but but they, will, um, they will do a lot of the work for you. And with the advantage which I outlined in my talk um, regarding water infiltration, reducing runoff mm -hmm. and helping during periods of drought. Yeah. So it's interesting to know other people are adopting that approach then. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You just mentioned about the earthworms. We were just wondering, did, did your increase in earthworms, did they all find their own way into your uh, land or did you help them along in any way? <laughs> no, they, 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 they've, they've done the reproduction themselves. 
Uh, we haven't been uh, buying earthworms in and, and, and spreading them. Uh, but 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 to, to be fair, you know, the, the comment I meant about feeding them um, is quite right. And, and so, you know, for instance, we're doing things like growing cover crops. Uh, so if we if we're if we're planting a crop a crop like spring wheat, for instance, instead of leaving the stubble bare through the winter time, we will go in with the direct drill and sow something like mustard or or rye, uh, and that forms a, a, a green cover, and then we destroy that in the spring, and and those crop residues go to feed the worms. So um, you know we are deliberately uh, trying to improve the soil health um, by the way we manage it. Thank you very much, Alistair. I hope to come and see you next year. We're in May and the talk was fascinating. It was wide ranging. It delivered a lot of interesting data. And I've seen a couple of farms near where we live where they're, they're not ploughing anymore. And I suspect that you're having a big impact and congratulations to you. And let's hope the Elms comes through quite soon. Thank you very much for an excellent talk. Thank you very much and thank you very much for your kind invitation.